Hello, hello, Scientist Buddies. It's me, Leslie, back to talk to you about science again this week. Since you last saw me, I've been trying to be active by getting outside even though it's cold. A few weekends ago, I went and visited Jay Cook State Park up in Duluth, Minnesota, and it was really fun. I hope you've been able to find fun things to do in the snow, too, while staying safe. Let's chat some more about what scientists do. Scientists ask questions about the world around them and then use either models or experiments to find answers to these questions. Models are helpful for when the problem is too big to be able to be measured easily, and experiments are helpful for when we want to change only one thing and see the outcome. Today, let's talk about how scientists use math and statistics to make sense of their data and form conclusions or find answers to their questions. Do you remember your hypothesis? A hypothesis is a statement that predicts the answer to the testable question you are asking. It's really important to make a hypothesis at the beginning of an experiment. For example, when we asked, how will DEET affect the growth and development of zebrafish embryos, our hypothesis might have been something like, DEET will cause the zebrafish embryos to develop more slowly. Or our hypothesis might have been, DEET will cause the zebrafish embryos to develop more quickly. Then, scientists collect data which will either support, meaning the hypothesis was correct, or refute, meaning the hypothesis was incorrect, the hypothesis, just like we did when we tested how DEET impacts zebrafish embryos. An experiment is considered to be highly significant if the data can clearly support or refute the hypothesis. It is only then that a scientist can make a conclusion or answer the question they set out to ask. We will talk more about how scientists use math to do this in the future. One example of a scientific question that we ask in my research lab is, what is my bacteria's favorite type of food? Or another way to ask the same question is, on which food source does my bacteria grow the best? One hypothesis to answer this question is that my bacteria will grow the best when given glucose or sugar in comparison to other types of food. To see if our hypothesis is correct, we can make different types of food for our bacteria to grow on and then grow the bacteria in test tubes with these different food types. Remember, because this is an experiment, we need to control for other variables. For example, the different tubes should all be grown for the same amount of time, at the same temperature, and with the same amount of light. Then, we can measure how much bacteria grew by counting how many bacteria are in the test tube. As you already know, bacteria are too small to see with just our eyes, so we can't just look at the test tube and count them. One way that we can count them is to take the bacteria liquid, put some onto a petri dish with food in it, wait for them to grow, and then count the number of bacterial colonies that form. This is an example of the type of research that I do for my job. Can you think of a different example of a scientific question, a related hypothesis, and what kind of data would be used to support or refute that hypothesis? Okay, let's change gears a bit and get into our science topic for this unit plants. First, it's important to be able to identify the parts of a plant and their functions so that we know how to talk about plants. Here's a diagram or a picture of a plant that shows its basic structures and their function. First, at the bottom we have the roots. The roots are underground and are important for absorbing water and minerals from the environment. Next is the stem which supports the plant so it doesn't fall over. Next is the fruit, which protects the seeds of the plant so that they can develop. After that is the leaf. The thing that I think is the coolest about plants is that they can make their own sugar to eat by using energy from the sun. They do this through a process called photosynthesis. Leaves are really important for absorbing sunlight, which is used as the energy needed to make sugar. Then, the plants use the sugar for growing just like we do. Lastly, we have the flower. Flowers are important for reproduction of plants because they hold the pollen of a plant. Pollen is spread from plant to plant by pollinators, and this process is essential for plants to make more plants. The plant in this picture has all of these parts, but sometimes plants don't have all of them all of the time. For example, you might know that some types of plants only have fruit for a certain time of year. And I'm sure you watch leaves turn red, orange, and yellow in the fall and then fall off of the tree for winter. This is because the plant doesn't need all of these parts all the time, and if the plant doesn't need to use it, then there's no reason for them to have the part all of the time. It's kind of like how you only need a coat in the winter time. 
In the summer when it's hot, there's no reason for you to wear a winter coat, so you don't. All right, now that you've seen a diagram, I want you to look at these two plants that I have at home and try to identify all of their parts. Pause this video when I show you the picture for a minute or two and see how many you can remember and name. So, why are we learning about plants anyways and why are they important? Plants provide food, shelter, clear air, beauty, soil stability by limiting erosion using their roots, and more. As we talked about earlier, plants can produce their own food using energy from the sun. We obviously can't do this and we have to eat things to stay alive. We rely on plants to produce food for us. Even foods that aren't plants, like dairy products and meats, come from animals that have to eat plants to stay alive. So without plants, we and other animals that can't do photosynthesis wouldn't be able to survive. This means that it's really important that we take care of the plants in our environment. Humans are negatively impacting the health of our planet by not valuing plant abundance and diversity as much as other things. For example, we have really fast rates of deforestation or cutting down trees all over the world. Sometimes we cut down trees to use the wood for making things, which is important, but by cutting down so many trees, we've also caused other problems. For example, forests are important habitats or places to live for many animals, other plants, and microbes. When the trees are cut down, the habitat is changed and many of these living things are not able to survive there anymore. And sometimes these trees are cut down to make room for people to build on and move into, which is called urbanization. Another way that humans can negatively impact plants is through climate change. Climate change influences weather patterns, which can change the temperature to be hotter or colder, change precipitation so that it rains more or rains less, or cause fires, all of which can hurt the native plants of the region. But it's important to remember that there's a lot of ways we can prevent this. You can take actions every day to reduce climate change and help keep plant diversity high. You can make sure to turn off the lights when you leave a room, take shorter showers, eat some meals with less meat, carpool to school, and so on. All right, scientist buddies, that's all I have for today. Please submit questions or comments to me. I'd love to hear from you. You can ask me about our unit or about anything else. I'd also love to hear from you if you don't have a question but want to tell me about something you've learned or found interesting from our time together. I will see you next time. Bye.